Oh, hello, I'm Manny, it's Matt Cornock, and this is our e-learning development team lunchtime webinar on the flipped classroom for creating video learning resources. The first part of this webinar, really, I'd like you to answer the question, what is the flipped classroom? What does the flipped classroom actually mean to you? If you pop your answer in the text chat to get us going. And if you don't know what the flip classroom means, that's absolutely fine as well. So Irina makes a very interesting point there. I'm going to jot some of these down as well, because that's a quite an interesting point there about two-way interaction. It's not necessarily the definition of the flip classroom, but certainly as we look at the learning designs, two-way interaction is going to be very important throughout. Any other suggestions as to what the flip classroom might actually mean? So we have a suggestion there where we're front loading, um, we maybe have a video, a lecture that's provided before the talk session, and then there's an aspect perhaps of student-led teaching where the real-time discussion and contact um, might be led by what the student wants to focus on based upon the lectures they've seen online beforehand. That's great. So you get the idea that we're trying to front load something and then make more use of that face-to-face -face time. And here's some of the definitions that are out there at the moment. So we might have um, some aspects that require work to be done before the lecture itself, before the face-to-face -face session. And I might refer to lecture when, when I mean the face-to-face -face session. But actually what we'll find is that when you're using that face-to-face -face time, the lecture isn't, isn't actually a key part of it because that content we've been given beforehand online using video. So any sort of structure, a blended learning model where we have content and activity that takes place before a face-to-face -face session and then a face-to-face -face session where that content and activity is drawn upon. Here we have, um, let me just bring up my points so we can see some other um, suggestions here, hopefully to develop a deeper understanding of the content as well. So if we think about the face-to-face -face lecture in a traditional model where we're delivering content in one way, some of the research where we've seen from students shows that uh, the students might think in the lecture, yeah, I've got that, I know that idea, I know what I'm trying to, what's going on here in this particular lecture. But when they try and apply that later on, when they're doing that independently, that's where things start to unravel and they don't quite see how things join up. So the idea with a flip classroom is an opportunity there to give them a dose of the content to begin with and then to apply that in the face-to-face -face session and so when they're trying to unpick why some things might not tie up together they're on hand there with each other they can do peer learning or they've got the lecture on hand as well to ask questions immediately in that face-to-face -face session and so the idea of the flipped classroom isn't just about providing content in advance it's about allowing scope for students to, to take their knowledge to the next level during that face-to-face -face session as well Ellen makes a very good point there. I'm, I'm referring here to uh, sort of online and face-to-face, -face, but if you have a more online model, um, more online module where there isn't a face-to-face -face component, we can still think about the interactions that take place online, whether that's asynchronously or synchronously, where you've still required some preparatory activity before that interactive component. So here we have the students that are coming ready to discuss in more detail and more depth the issues that they perhaps are, they don't have the, all the answers to from that content. What I'd like to look at um, as a framework for looking at the FLIP model is uh, the five-stage blended learning model we have here at the university. So just to have a quick look through this to begin with. The first stage is all about preparation, and you'll hear this time and again throughout the webinar where I'm asking you to think about what you actually want to achieve through this particular learning design. So here you identify your rationale for approach, but crucially, you're linking the online and the face-to-face -face learning objectives, and that's crucial in the flipped learning design. You don't want students to be doing something online that isn't then going to be drawn upon in the face-to-face -face session. The second stage is about socialization, and in some respects, that's the idea of setting expectations. That's showing that actually if you don't do the online stuff in advance, if you don't do the flipped component, then actually what happens in the face-to-face -face environment or the um, synchronous interactive environment isn't going to be of any value to you because you've not committed yourself into that model, that buy-in. So there's an aspect here about expectation setting, and that's one of the things we'll need to touch upon later on as well.
Throughout, you'll need to support the participation. And that's not just supporting in the face-to-face -face environment. That's also to do with supporting students to get into the online environment, how you can support students to check their understanding in the online environment before they come to the face-to-face -face session as well. So just because you're shifting the content delivery online doesn't mean that that doesn't still require some form of support. And then through the face-to-face -face interactions, students perhaps are more engaged, more, in, more active in their learning, and that's the point where you start to reinforce the learning objectives that you set to begin with. So you, that's where you draw in the learning objectives from that uh, preparatory activity, and you put that into the face environment. Face environment. Finally, we're at the final stage of our five-stage blended model is to close. That's to wrap everything up. That's to summarize what's been learned but then also take the students onto the next part of the module, the next learning objective. So that's a, a very brief overview of the five-stage model, but I'd like you to bear that in mind throughout. What I'd like to show you now is a, a more simplistic view of the flipped learning, um, which you're, we're just talking here about before class, during class, and after class. And here we have the new content, learning activity, and after class, a better understanding through an applied activity in the class itself. And we're leading on to the next topic and connections. So I have a question for you now. And this question here is, what types of new content might we be presenting students in advance of the face-to-face -face session? What sort of things do you want to convey to your students before they come to class? Just pop some ideas into the text chat box. That's great. So we have some suggestions in there. The idea of putting in some definitions, some terminology, the threshold concepts, those ideas that might be counterintuitive, might be stumbling blocks for students to, to get a grasp of. The sorts of content you put in a normal lecture, in some respects, the idea of theory, evidence, and the reading that backs that up, and a summary of the theoretical approaches. So there's a lot of content there. Now, how do you want the students to actually engage with that content? What do you want the students to do whilst they're getting engaged with that content before they arrive to the session? What sorts of activities do you want students to, to be doing whilst they're being exposed to that content? I mean, pop a few ideas in the text chat box. That's great. So thanks very much for your suggestions there. They all really revolve around um, trying to make the most of that face-to-face that -face time and get the students to think about what they are going to be doing the face-to-face -face time. Testing their understanding. That's useful for the student, but it's also useful for you as the instructor when you think about what you're going to be doing the face-to-face -face time and beyond to give you an idea of what the students are actually um, understanding based upon that lecture. Further reading, analysis, that's right, getting students to start engaging with that content and applying it in some way, uh, prioritizing their interaction and focusing their attention on key aspects. That's great. So that's the sort of things that we want the students to be doing even before they get to the lecture. 
So how are we going to actually make that happen? Well, that's about structuring that online activity. And you'll need to think about how the resources that you create, the video resources you create, are actually embedded within a form of activity. Asking students to perhaps watch a video, read a particular um, article, and then do something. And that might be undertake the quiz. That might be write a short 200-word summary that they, they can get a a sense that they're actually doing something with that content before they come to the face-to-face -face session. So it's no good just providing a link to something. So that's the first thing I wanted to really make a, a point of there. And let's have a look at some of the examples then from uh, real-world practice. So one of the case studies we have at York is uh, using video to prepare students in the use of lab skills. So instead of using up the lab, lab time, that's very costly, you've got demonstrations to pay, it's not perhaps the best use of the time for the students in the lab to be uh, shown how to use every little bit of equipment when they could have been shown that in advance and then using the equipment in practice in the lab <laughs> setting so they get experiential learning through the lab environment rather than just new content. There's a safety aspect to this as well. So in this particular case, study, the students had to undertake a quiz before they could even get through the lab door. So this has a, a multi-role in, in effect this particular uh, case study. So we, here we have um, some structured content, um, we've got some information, we have a, a quiz uh, that the students then have to do and they have videos that were actually in this case hosted on YouTube. The workflow then is that they are assigned a lab task to begin with, they're set up with that context, what they're actually going to be doing that week. That's the learning objective for that week. And that's not just the learning objective for the online activity, that's the whole week, how the whole activity loops and bridges across that time and space. You have the video, the quiz, and then the practical. Another example, which comes from a paper by McLaughlin, um, which is actually on uh, pharmaceutical, uh, a pharmaceutical course, but I, show, I like the diagram here. It seems a bit complex to begin with, but when you look at it component by component, you start to see how flipped learning design can be quite um, intricate, but also offer opportunities for new forms of learning and teaching. So let's start over here on this side. We have some offloaded content. This is what they're calling it. They're calling their lectures online offloaded content, stuff that the students will have to engage with in advance. Most of this um, is found what they call foundational material, but there will be some aspects, perhaps the threshold concepts that Ella mentioned there, that are too complex to deal with online alone. These are the ideas that really need teasing out, and that's the content that's then focused upon in the flipped classroom in the face-to-face -face model. So here they have, um, uh, they start off the session with a, a polling, a clicker-based session, again, to test the, the understanding. They have a peer learning exercise, pair and share exercise, where they have to justify their um, responses to the quiz, or they're putting together a presentation, as in this case down here, which would then form further discussion. But in the middle here, is a, it's quite a useful concept to think about with the flipped learning model. While you, must be able, while you might be able to shift some of the content in advance, there are some key concepts that do require a little bit more detail. And therefore, picking up on both how the students have performed in the quizzes, how they've performed in their peer learning, how they might have performed in their presentations, micro lectures, short, really short, up to three minutes lectures that address some of the key points, some of the key misconceptions. And that's where some of the face-to-face -face time is spent. So here, that moves on towards assessment, and in this particular model, there's quite a, a strong linkage between um, the before, during, and after. So we have the self-paced content assigned reading, the in-class activities, and then onwards to formative assessments and projects. I will share the links to these case studies afterwards as well, so you can look at them in more detail. The third um, case study I want to show you um, comes from uh, an arts and science program where it's, it's thinking about science not in the usual way of just talking at students um, over uh, to develop their knowledge in, in some foundational concepts, but this particular module was more um, discussion-based and might appeal more to social sciences. And here, the teacher provided um, some online webinars, in this case, and some stimulus resources. But from that, students would start to ask questions, start to decide how they want to focus their attention and what the topics were that they wanted to look in more detail. So we mentioned earlier on, one of the responses to why we want to do a flipped classroom is to allow the students to lead their 
um, studies through a particular module, through a particular topic. So this particular lecturer asked the students to vote on the topics in advance. The lecturer then created some uh, plenary questions and some micro lectures to, to use the face-to-face -face time and then they'd have in-class discussion. Now some of the key learning points from this particular case study I found uh, particularly useful to share with you. And one of them was about um, that they rarely had time to both discuss and summarize what had been learned. So one of the key learning points from this particular case study is that you need structure throughout. It's no good um, hoping that the face-to-face -face time will, will just fill itself up. Um, there still needs to be an element of structure to that time, which indeed the first case, the second case study I showed you here, this one here, has a lot of structure. We've even got time quotas on the different activities. So when you do have some discussion activities, think about how you're going to wrap that up and almost summarize where you've got to with the students, drawing upon both the stuff in advance and the activities from the face-to-face -face time as well. Okay, I'm just going to pause there for a second. Um, do you have any questions at this stage about any of that sort of idea of learning design and how the two might interrelate, or some ideas or suggestions even? I think we're okay to continue, then we shall continue. So the question I have for you now, can I just share a YouTube video? So there's a little poll tool that uh, will pop up on your screen now. Um, can I just share a YouTube video? Yes or no? Okay, so we have uh, Bit of a split between the two the two answers there. Can I just share a YouTube video? Yes or no? What uh, what the question should have really said is it probably depends on the context. Um, I think is is the normal uh, response to this one. But it's interesting to see that yes, we have some people that, that, that we can just share a YouTube video. So why why not? There are some people who said that we, we can't just share a, a YouTube video. What are some of the responses from those who said no? Do you want to pop your um, answer in the text chat box there. Why can't we just share a YouTube video? Irene makes a good point there. We need to give the video some context. We need to think about the focus of the video in the, in the context of the activity. Uh, Chris quite rightly points out there might be a copyright implication there, which we haven't thought about yet. So the question really was about, can we just have a link on Yorkshire to YouTube? A really good uh, suggestion there about how students might expect you as the instructor to do some teaching as well. And I think that's a fair point, and that comes down to expectation setting. And some of that's to do with um, how your role as an instructor perhaps isn't to deliver the content, but to facilitate the learning in the face-to-face -face environment. One of the uh, case studies that we, uh, we looked at there about um, the, the, that discussion, that plenary session, students had to buy into that. And that was a team taught module. So the whole team that was on that module had to buy into that type of learning. And that might cause a bit of tension. So it's important to, to sort of raise that that's what's happening uh, in that module very early on, even at the point where students are choosing the module too. But that's a very interesting point about the role of the, of the tutor. So in, in the context of, of YouTube then, um, we might end up having some very undefined learning outcomes. And this might be YouTube video, it might be a video you provide yourself, it doesn't have to be on YouTube, just use that as a, an example. But if you've asked the students, okay, here's a YouTube video, well, what are the students actually expected to take away from that video? Now, you might say, quite rightly, um, the students can take away whatever they like, but if that video is being used as precursor to their face-to-face -face time, and as the main way that they're going to be exposed to new content, we want to make sure that that video is set within the context of the module. So instead of just providing a link to the YouTube video, you set the intended learning outcomes, perhaps linking to previous content, then providing links to specific videos that align to that context, 
an activity to help students judge and measure their understanding and that leads into the class environment where they're more prepared and they can demonstrate that understanding through a particular task or discussion. Does that make sense? Do you want to give me a thumbs up or a question mark or something if you'd like to ask a question there? Okie dokie. Let's move on to the technical stuff then. How do we link to videos? So the first thing is that if you're using Yorkshire VLE, um, the main tool that you want to use throughout the VLE is actually the item tool. And you can find this in the build content menu within the Yorkshire VLE. Just make sure edit mode is on and you'll see that appear at the top of your page when you go to any content area in your VLE site. So build content and then item. Now, I'd recommend using the item tool here rather than something like the mashup, the direct mashup down the bottom there, or even there's a Panopto link, a replay link that appears in the tools menu, because that item tool will allow you to provide the context. So within the item tool, within the toolbar, you have the options for uh, mashups, and then you can bring in a YouTube video. So if we went to this item here, put the cursor in the box, mashups, YouTube video, we'd end up with an ability to search YouTube still within the VLE, you find a video you want, click select, and then that will drop into the VLE site. You can, of course, also link to replay. So again, instead of from the mashups menu, you choose YouTube, you choose Panopto video instead. And again, you'll be able to choose of any of the videos that are currently linked to your module. Just check the box, click insert videos, and then that will drop in onto your VLE site. Another way is just to create a link to the video, and that, that has a problem there because you won't have that context of the, um, of the particular activity. So avoid just putting in uh, a link without any framework for the activity. So that's how the YouTube, uh, sorry, that's how the Panopto displays itself. So how do we make the videos? And I'm send a link around and how to do all those things as well because it's better to show you step by step uh, and you can have a quick look at those. But let's move on to how to make videos now. Recording environment is the first thing you need to look at. Uh, whether you're doing this at your desk, as I am here, uh, with a webcam, or whether you're out in the field, perhaps, uh, and you want, you want to use your mobile phone, you need to think about the recording environment. How can you control that environment so that you get a nice, clear audio recording? Above anything else, it's the sound that is the most important part of uh, any video resource. Without the sound, none of the images is going to make any sense at all. So you do need to pay attention to the sound quality. So in the recording environment, make sure your windows are closed. You often get geese and aeroplanes going overhead at the university. Uh, make sure the doors are shut and turn off your phone, turn off the air conditioning. It might mean that you've got a fan like I have behind me here. Just have to make sure that's turned off and squeaky chairs. Um, believe it or not, they are the most irritating things to listen to on a recording. So all those things, any source of noise, you really need to try and control. When you think about the structure of your pre-recorded lecture, so I'm going to assume here they're going to put together a short uh, pre-recorded lecture. First of all, as we mentioned before, really make it clear what you're trying to achieve through that lecture. What's the learning objective that that's going to work for? I'd write a crib sheet. So that could be a bulleted points uh, list where you've just got the key points that you're going to work your way through. It might be a copy of some slides that you've annotated. That's fine. And don't be afraid when you're doing your recording. If you look at the, my webcam at the moment, let me just um, close that down for a second and you'll see me on your screen now. When you look at your webcam and you're talking to a person on the webcam, don't be afraid to look down at your notes. That's fine because that's showing that you've you know, you're, you're here as a teacher, you're here to, to work with the students. It's more personal that way. Sometimes the talking heads can feel a bit false if, if it almost looks like a TV program. So don't be afraid to go down that route if you want. Let's just bring up my slides once again. And then think about your recording itself. It needs a big beginning, middle and an end, unsurprisingly. At the start of your recording, make a real clear introduction and to say what you're actually going to do in that recording. Then go in a logical sequence throughout your key points, building upon those key points, avoiding any tangential information. 
you want to make sure that you keep focused. You don't want to add in an anecdote from wherever that you might do in a normal lecture, but you don't want to do it on a video lecture. And then finally, conclude your recording. Say what you've done and say how that links in to the activity or the next task or the next recording. So it has a, another question for you now. I've put in there, um, write a crib sheet with content lasting no more than 10 minutes. How long do you actually think you should make your online lectures? That's really interesting here. We've got a full range of replies here. These, this is what I'm talking about expectation setting here. When I've, asked you, I've asked you just now, how long do you think an online lecture should be? And we've had a range from uh, what we've got there, five minutes to 40 minutes. And that's all down to how long an individual is going to sit watching their computer screen and paying attention. So some people there that put in five minutes, why would you make your recording five minutes long. Why would it not be any longer? So there's one response there, so students can drop in and out. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, there's a lot there about attention span, attention span being short, trying to get your key points across. And actually, when you've got your very short video, you're thinking there, well, what is the key content that I want my students to know? Because you're going to use the face-to-face -face time and other activities to extend that key content. You're just trying to deliver the baseline there to make sure that all the students come in at the same level, and then you go to the next level with subsequent activities or subsequent videos. That's absolutely fine. So there's a, a case study we've got on the e-learning website, which comes from computer science, where the lecturer has actually broken down quite a complex lecture course into a series of short five-minute videos. Those five-minute videos themselves are clustered in groups, so there's about six videos per group, and those groups are essentially what used to be an individual lecture. So there's a relationship between those videos, but the videos are short so that students can get a key point and then try it out. In that case, it was computer science, so he was talking about a particular program language or a particular approach or model. So there's a link there between um, breaking down quite a complex topic into smaller bite-sized chunks. That doesn't mean that those bite-sized chunks need to be simplistic or basic by any means. It just means that you're staging that consumption um, a little bit more based upon um, the, the, the single points that you want to put in that individual video. It also means that if a student wants to revisit something, they can just go straight to that video rather than have to work out where it is in that big long uh, recording. That's great, thanks for that. In terms of practically doing your recording then, uh, one of the key points would be to pause between your key points. Um, that will allow you to edit your recording down if you need to, but also, if you make a mistake, you can just keep on recording. So if you've made a point, didn't quite work out, just pause for a couple of seconds and start again. You don't have to stop the recording and redo the whole thing. Any program that's got a, a basic editor in will allow you to, to chop bits out. And as long as you give yourself enough time to pause, make an edit point, and then you can carry on with the next bit, it's very easy to do. So always pause between your key points. It also helps you pace that recording a little bit better as well. And if you find that the points aren't flowing one after the other, that's probably going to be the experience of the students as well. If you're using PowerPoint slides, best thing to do is to set up your PowerPoint slides to meet the screen size that you're using. So here uh, I've got a wide screen on my computer. I've got some wide uh, screen slides. I've set this up to be a widescreen slide in PowerPoint. 
the reason is if you don't do that you'll end up with some black bars uh, on the left and the right of the recording um, which means you're not actually utilizing the full screen space you can make some uh, longer wider slides to, to put maybe two columns in or, or anything you want it just gives you a bit more space and makes it look a bit smarter so that was uh, in Office 2010, uh, you go to the design tab of PowerPoint and then go to page setup and then you can change the slide skies for on-screen show. And in the newer version of PowerPoint, you go to design slide size and you can quickly change it to widescreen. So do that when you're putting your slides together. If you do that after you've put your slides together and you then change it to widescreen, things start to get squished and, and stretched and things. So um, do that when you first start. If you're using video feedback, then you'll want to make sure that the work provided by the students is as large as possible on the screen. If you're using something like the Panopto at desk recorder, which we'll be showing you in a second, that records the whole screen. So normally when you open up a Word document, it's set to 100% zoom. You just need to make that as large as possible so the text completely fills the screen and that makes it a lot easier for the students to see the work as you talk through it with your feedback. Check what's captured as well. Um, here's a, if you go to the, uh, the top of your screen uh, at the moment, the top left, you will see that you have a pencil icon. If you click that, you'll be able to draw onto the slide I'm showing at the moment. So just give that a go. What I'd like you to do is just highlight um, with maybe a different color, which you can choose from the blue blob on the right hand side. Just choose a red pen and highlight all aspects that you think are distracting. So in this particular case, I'm trying to show a student how to sum some cells in Excel, all the things that are gonna distract you. That's brilliant, that's really good, thanks for that. Right, so we've, let's just talk ourselves through this. Let's start with this uh, lovely massive desktop icons on the side there, and uh, I'm just gonna remove all your annotations for now, just give me a second, there we go. So all these lovely desktop icons on the side there, uh, you can hide those on your desktop if you do want to show something, um, perhaps you've got uh, several applications you want to show together, just hide all your icons. Uh, you right click on the desktop and then you go to view and then you can show and hide and show the icons there. So in particular, if you've got some actions or documents uh, with file names that you probably don't want to be screen captured, it's definitely worth hiding your desktop. Um, we've also got a couple of browser windows open and that might be useful if you wanted to show um, the how-to guide to Excel whilst you're also doing the Excel demonstration. But in this case here, we've got distracting images. We've also got um, some other app, um, websites open in the background. For example, I'm showing my students here that I've had to Google Google uh, in order to access it. Um, I've also got here an Amazon um, uh, website opened in the background there, which um, has the phrase back scrap, and you can only imagine what that's trying to be searching for. So you've got to be watch out for all these strange things that might be lurking on your screen, including at the bottom here, the taskbar. Um, some, if you might have um, icons that you don't want to share on your screen recording. So again, you can hide and show the taskbar by right clicking it and making it automatically disappear. Wherever possible, of course, show in full screen, but you might want to show um, things, multiple things together, in which case just clean up your entire working space so that you're not capturing things you don't want to capture. Any questions uh, on that before we move on to the final part of the webinar? If you're all right, give me a thumbs up, else type in your question. Okay, I want to show you a couple of examples now. Um, so the first example there, I've just put in the text chat box, um, which if you click that link, it will prompt you to log in with your standard University of York username and password. And that is a example capture, which I recorded on mobile phone. So I'll just give you a few seconds to look at that. <laughs> 